Thanks. Great. Hi, everyone. Uh, so my name is Jay Paul Neely, and I'm a designer and researcher based here in London, and want to talk tonight about uh, speculative design as an approach to uh, unpack and understand the future of UI. So we've had talks on particular technologies tonight, and I want to talk more about a sort of method or approach that I think all of us should be using uh, in, our, in our practices. So just uh, by way of background and a little bit about me, um, I sort of have a number of hats that I'm wearing at the moment. I'm a tutor at the Royal College of Art on the Service Design course, and I previously studied there on the Design Interactions course with uh, Tony Dunn and Fiona Raby, if anyone's familiar with some of that, uh, that work. I also work on a, a project uh, called Masamichi Sozo, where we're working on uh, tools supporting the optimization of human happiness. I've, I've got another project called the Osarian that some of you have perhaps heard of, where we're looking at using artificial intelligence to augment uh, human creativity. Um, but the, the projects and the work that I want to talk about tonight are uh, with Neely Worldwide, a consultancy that we're, we're running, looking to support businesses in their use of speculative design methods uh, in, in some of their work. And so normalizing a lot of these practices uh, to become a regular part of, of, uh, of our practice as researchers and designers. Um, so speculative design, how, how many of you have heard of speculative design, just by way of hands? Okay, a handful. Um, and how many of you have actually used speculative design methods in your, in your work? Okay, a handful, great. Well, so we'll start with kind of an introduction. Sometimes speculative design is called uh, critical design or uh, design futures or design fiction. Um, and it's sort of an emerging discipline looking to design future products and services as a way to understand the social, cultural, and ethical implications of emerging technologies or trends. Um, and the, the practice is sort of emerging in a number of places, but we're seeing real opportunities for, for value in, in different business settings. So one way that it's often presented or talked about is sort of future cones of possibility. So if you think about time uh, moving out, and from today, we sort of have a cone of a probable future. So a future that uh, is a small variation from our current trajectory and where we're headed that we could imagine with a high likelihood would happen. And if we think about a, a larger, slightly larger deviation, we get into a, um, a probable or a uh, plausible future. So again, the likelihood is, is a little bit smaller, but it's still something that we could believe happening. And then we start to look at, at the edges of possibility. So types of futures that have a very, very low probability, but still uh, exist within the realm of possibility, something that could actually happen in the future. And so a lot of our work as designers is, is right here in sort of the near term, solving problems for the business as it exists today. And speculative design is about taking projects at different ranges of, of possibility and plausibility and at different uh, time frames into the future. And by designing these future products and services, we use those to understand uh, different elements of those futures, use that learning then to change our perspective on our current state, our understanding of, of opportunities moving forward. And the goal is through those conversations to sort of navigate uh, new paths forward, that we can have conversations about new preferable futures and what we're really interested in, in happening. So just a few, or another idea that becomes really important, and I think one of the reasons we need to be doing more speculative design work in our practices is the idea of Amara's law. And essentially, when we look into the future at sort of the, the change that's happening, uh, people tend to think about that change in a sort of linear fashion. But in reality, a lot of technologies change in, in an exponential fashion. And so what happens then is in the, in the near term, we're we overestimate the amount of change that will take place, and it leaves us sort of disappointed in what's actually happened. But in the medium to long term, we radically underestimate the impact and change of some of these technologies. So I mean, uh, virtual reality, uh, AI are perfect examples where there's been research for 20 or 30 years in some of these spaces, and just in, in a very short time frame, uh, the technology becomes accessible and, and is, is you know, impacting a lot of different industries really quickly. So the opportunity is to spend more time further out into the future so we're not sort of left behind at these moments of, of change and transition. 
so just a, a few ideas really quickly. Uh, speculative design is not fantasy. So we, we try to work very closely with scientists, with uh, developers and experts in the, in the tech that we're looking at to really understand what is actually possible in these spaces. We want to avoid anything that is magical or fanciful. Um, speculative design is not purely utopic or dystopic, uh, but the futures are really complex. And it's really interesting to present work that shows some of those complexities and helps us understand uh, you know, what is good and bad about a particular future. And what's interesting about this work, a lot of the futures that are created for us that we see are sort of very, very optimistic uh, futures designed for us by companies that have a very particular vision of what that future should be. So Corning Glass creates a vision of the future, and everything is glass, and everything is a touch screen, and it all works perfectly. Uh, but more interesting are to view futures uh, in, and really understand all of the complexities that might exist in, in those moments. Uh, again, the goal, and this group will know this well, but is to design for the sort of messy, contradictory, complex uh, people that we are rather than the sort of perfect consumers that we're supposed to be. So we're very interested in designing futures where the tech breaks down and where things go wrong, and those become uh, moments for, for learning and insight. Um, the, the practice is not predictive. So we're not saying this is the future or this is what will happen. It's, it's kind of different from future forecasting. We're merely showing uh, a one or or many particular types of futures. And so we'll often work in multiples and show, show many different directions as a way to kind of explore, uh, explore what's coming. Um, the practice is also really useful in unclear contexts. So when you have uh, an emerging technology that we don't know a lot about or there's not a lot of data or detail on it, then this type of practice becomes incredibly useful to generate perspective around, around that. Um, we also try to, with speculative design, engage through prototypes. So just as, as you know, the, the prototype is what can actually uh, make the work tangible for decision makers within an organization. We find the same with speculative futures. So designing an, an actual artifact from that future or creating a video scenario, creating a prototype in some fashion, allows for a type of engagement with the ideas that is really useful. So users or decision makers within the organization suspend their disbelief it allows them to start thinking in new ways, and we sort of see a, a loosening of reality's grip on, on their thinking. It allows us to, to open up new types of conversations. And then finally, the, the goal is really to, to generate answers and perspective within the organization uh, through questions and through these types of prompts, and to really expand the consideration set that the groups are using. And so we, you know, through these alternatives, you start to introduce new types of language, new frames, uh, new discussions that, that open up because of this. So I want to show you just uh, one uh, project and talk to you a little bit about how this begins to apply in, in industry settings. Uh, so this was some work that we did with Movil Lab. Uh, Movil is a, has anyone heard of Movil? Uh, Movil is a German company, it's a Mercedes-Benz subsidiary, and they're looking to sort of be the Amazon of transportation. So there's a Movil app in Germany that looks very similar or similar to City Mapper, but it also allows you to buy every single ticket uh, across that journey uh, within the app. So you can buy uh, uh, you know, car shares or train tickets or bike shares or rental cars. All of those purchases are handled through the application. And the lab is the group within the organization that's generating, exploring emerging technologies as they relate to mobility and looking at, at, uh, at wh what impact those will have for the, for the business. And so we were, we were asked to sort of explore future speculative mobilities. So we, we, did the, we ran a sort of one-week workshop with a group of master's students uh, from a design school uh, in Germany. And we briefed the group on 60 emerging technologies, so artificial intelligence and AI, uh, things that you'll be familiar with, as well as emerging trends or, or uh, factors in the world. So uh, climate change, growing global inequity, uh, financial instabilities in markets. And we, after briefing the group, we sort of cut them loose to generate uh, 
future proposals and, and perspectives on, on any number of those directions. And I'm not going to show all of the work, but at the end of that week, we probably had 20 different proposals on, on directions or moments in the future that we thought were really interesting to, to talk about. And so I'll just uh, I'll share a few of these that uh, I thought were kind of interesting. So uh, this was uh, looking at a digital watch face and just a very simple insight of, of looking at what uh, digital watch faces you know, enable in terms of our understanding of transport. And one of the ideas was that uh, a lot of times we think about movement in in terms of uh, geographical locations and in terms of maps. And they were interested in translating that and looking at, at travel really in terms of time. And so the, the first face that you can see, one of the companies that Mercedes-Benz operate is, operates is Car2Go. Uh, so Car2Go is like Zipcar. It's a shared car service that anyone can unlock a car and use the car within the city. Uh, the cars don't have fixed parking spaces, and so they're always moving around the city. So the app, the, the sort of blue line there on the first face, indicates your walking distance to a Car2Go at any particular moment. Um, and also explored other, other representations of that. And even on the third face, you can see an entire journey. Uh, so maybe the journey home, the walk, the train ride, uh, the transfers, um, and other pieces of the journey. What was interesting on this piece, again, it, it started in a moment where we had an open space to play in the future. And actually, this was one that we realized, oh, this, is, this actually makes perfect sense. So it was, it was something that was quickly handed off to the product team working on Apple Watch. And this becomes then a feature that's, that's implemented there. Um, also, uh, this was one of the elements from a couple of years ago, but quickly identified the opportunities for uh, discussions within chat, chat uh, for logistics and, and ride selection uh, between users. Um, there was also a, a real insight uh, about self-driving cars. So when self-driving cars become ubiquitous, when car-to-goes now operate across a city, there's a huge amount of video data that's gathered from all of those cars, and the, the mapping uh, that that then enables becomes really interesting. Uh, so the designers were looking at scenarios where that, that data would be used to, uh, in this case, track down a stolen bike. Uh, and identifying what that sort of uh, video content looks like and how someone might explore that. So whole new types of businesses then, then uh, coming into play for a company like Car2Go that's about mobility. So uh, another interesting uh, discussion was around uh, personalization of, of car sharing. So that's... Um, the, they, the designers had come across an advertisement, I don't know if anyone's seen this, uh, that Mercedes-Benz ran, where the, on the side of the car they covered it with uh, LEDs, a sort of LED screen, and then on the other side had a camera filming the side of the road. And they would then project that image on the side of the car. But what it created is a sort of invisible car uh, driving along. It was really disconcerting for people to see this sort of ghost uh, shape of a car driving by. And so the students realized, oh, that's something that could easily be applied uh, to these car-to-goes and allow a sort of radical personalization. So as you take the car share, uh, you then select what that car looks like and, and you know, make that your own. You could imagine business logos or other things showing up. Or as, as a police officer or as an emergency care worker, medical worker steps into the car, becomes an ambulance or, or police, right? So we, we get that sort of skin change. Uh, another interesting exploration on augmented reality, looking at uh, privacy and anonymity in ride sharing and what, what that might look like as heads, heads up displays become more normalized. So I'll, I'll talk about these last two in a little more depth. Um, one of the things that I loved about that Movil did with this is they took all of these different uh, sort of proposals, and again, some went straight into existing product teams uh, for launch, and others, these initial prototypes were further iterated and sort of used for discussion within the organization. Um, and one of, the, one of the interesting moments was a discussion around when cars, when self-driving cars are ubiquitous, which is happening much faster than I th think many of us are realizing, uh, what does that change about, about our world? And, and it changes a lot. And one of the, the kind of clever questions was, well, what do kids' books start to look like? Or what are the questions kids ask about these cars in the future? So this is a, this is a, a children's book, Where Do Cars Go at Night? And it tells the story of a, of a car 
that's dropped a child off from, uh, from school at the end of the day, and, and then the car is sort of reporting on its activities at the night. So it's musing on uh, how the parking garage has now uh, been completely reused for, by different businesses, talks about uh, its maintenance routine at night, and also it's the delivery activities that it undertakes. But the, the, the artifact, right, that, that prototype becomes a really fascinating tool to engage in a lot of different discussions about uh, self-driving cars and how that changes the urban environment and, and uh, you know, our, our activities with them. Um, What's also been great, they've got a wonderful video where they've, they're reading the book to children and to hear these children's reactions, uh, you know, realizing that this will be the world that they live in in, in 10 years. So the other, the other project that I quite loved, uh, this is called Project Greenskin. And uh, the designer became fascinated with, uh, that we were working with, became fascinated with sort of the green roof movement, uh, issues with climate change, but also uh, made a calculation that uh, surface area of cars in Los Angeles uh, is equal to the surface area of the Black Forest in Germany. And the, so the number of cars that, that are, are sort of available or taking up space in our urban environments is pretty spectacular. And the, I'm, I'm not sure if there are any guesses in the room in terms of the actual percentage utilization of cars, but it's actually around 4%. So cars are used 4% of their lifetime, and the rest of the time they sit idly. So he became interested in, in actually a greening of these cars and imagined sort of freeways of cars where uh, trees were growing on top and, and sort of grassy knolls and, uh, and even, even gardens of, of uh, veg. And uh, to Movil's credit, they, they actually built uh, one of these cars. And they talked with German authorities about what types of materials would be uh, legal to put on the car. They looked at different sorts of, of application techniques. And they, they built the car and then drove it around and took it to public spaces. And again, the artifact becomes this really interesting tool uh, to engage people in a number of conversations about car sharing, about uh, electric cars, about climate change, about uh, the impact and utilization of cars in our urban spaces. And I guess it's, it's one of the interesting uh, things as well, I think, with speculative design, is often the designers are very good at creating some of these futures, uh, but I, it, there's sort of a call here for researchers to participate in this work off, uh, as well. Uh, the designers often aren't equipped to unpack the reactions to these artifacts that, that users have. So when you get a public engaging with these ideas, uh, it becomes really interesting to, to learn from those threads and see what they're coming up with. And again, the opportunity with speculative design is to take those insights and to take what's being learned in those moments and then to apply that back to our, our current thinking and our current trajectories with, within our business. And, and projects like this uh, kind of pass through the organization in a way that you sort of dream of as a researcher and a designer, right? It has, it has an effect and opens up conversations with senior leadership, with other teams that, are, that can be difficult to do in, in other ways. And so that, that becomes one of the usefulness, uh, useful elements of, of speculative design approaches. Um, so in terms of the future of UI, um, I, I just would I essentially invite all of you <laughs> to be part of the creation of the future of UI. And I, I'd ask a quick question here. How many of you in the organizations that you're working in have a perspective on uh, artificial intelligence and how it will impact your business? OK, so I'm, I'm going with about 5% there. So, or virtual reality. How many of you have done work on impacts of virtual reality for your business? Okay. So maybe 2% or even less. Uh, the, the trick is that, again, these, these uh, technologies are kind of here already, and they'll have dramatic impacts on all of our businesses. And the opportunity for designers is to use speculative design to generate to generate perspectives now. And so I'd encourage all of us to become a part of the creation of these futures by, by generating these possible moments. So uh, just a few kind of closing thoughts. Again, the opportunity is to use speculative design to generate perspectives within the organization. And so any time there is an emerging technology or an emerging trend, uh, we have the chance to use uh, this approach uh, to begin to make sense of that, to begin to create meaning and data within the organization to start these conversations 
nations. Uh, the other interesting thing is you back into it. So by spending time in the future, by thinking about these sort of uh, scenarios that are on the edges of plausibility and possibility, you, you generate insights and directions that become actually really powerful and useful in your current product set and in, in your current strategies and directions you're going forward. So again, that becomes a really useful activity that I think should become a regular part of our practice. Um, also, I, I think user centricity is incredibly problematic. And I think that focus on the narrow goals of the user as it relates to the business as it exists today uh, leads us to a sort of uh, narrow view of the opportunity space that we're, we're working within. And so by creating areas where you can open up and work outside of that uh, and understand sort of all of the systems that are at play, all of the impacts that are that are operating in that moment, I think it creates a sort of radical expansion of our purview that leads to new types of questions and discussions that are really valuable. Um, and then finally, I think creating that space or stepping away from the current sort of needs and goals of the business uh, allow you to be critical and allow you to, to ask types of questions about the business and about the work that you're doing that are very different than what you'd normally get to discuss. And I think that's really important for us as people and as humans with an incredible amount of power as we're developing and designing these tools that go out into the world and affect people's lives. But I also think it, it opens up all sorts of new opportunities uh, for the business uh, by creating sort of new goals and directions that we maybe didn't consider otherwise. Um, so I, I absolutely hope that uh, speculative design is, is something that you'll begin to consider as part of a normal part of, of your design and your research activities. And I think the opportunity for all of us is, is to participate uh, more fully in this sort of uh, future and the design of the future of UI. So thank you very much. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Hi. Oh, God, right. Um, I've done, I'm a researcher, I'm an academic researcher, and um, I've done a bit of work on speculative design and design fiction. Yep. And my problem with it is that I had a different experience to what you were talking about. I found it really hard to engage with companies about the results of this work. So what I'm trying to say is that they were really interested. They thought, oh, that looks really fancy. And it's like, it was really engaging. But they just thought it was like a hocus pocus iRobot film that yeah. they wouldn't want to take action on. They wouldn't change their strategy for making a new car just based on a design fiction work. Yeah. So what I'm trying to ask is, you know, have you got any recommendations of how we can engage with more business-like people about convincing them about the value of speculative design? Yeah. So I, I think um, a, a few thoughts. I mean, one, one I think becomes opportunities to do speculative design within those organizations. Yeah. So rather than the creation happening externally and then being brought in, uh, you know, I think, I think participating with them or with internal teams becomes one of the interesting elements. Mm -hmm. I think the, the other trick is there's just a familiarity or a comfort with the, the approach or, or thinking in these, these moments that are further ahead. It's so far, in some instances, yeah. so far away from their sort of daily decision making, it can be really tricky. Mm. Uh, the, the other piece is I, I think that problem is absolutely something that, that we've run into as well. And I, I think there is value here, but there is work to do in sort of translating mm -hmm. and, and showing what that value is to these organizations. So it's, it's creating spaces and moments where we can do this work. Um, and it's engaging existing design teams in the work. And then I, I think I agree, there's, there's sort of an expertise that can happen mm -hmm. in translation back or a distillation of, of yeah, the exactly, insights yeah, from yeah. that work that, that makes sense. And mm -hmm. I don't think you can leave it to your business teams. I don't think you can show them this and, and say, you know, learn from it. I, I think it's the onus is on those creating speculative design to actually, you know, highlight what, what those learnings are. Yeah. I'll ask great. another question since the okay, podcast question. <laughs> it's also, I also think it's very tricky to, I mean, you asked at the beginning who he has done any speculative design. And we didn't get many people. Yeah, yeah. And I'm assuming this is a room full of designers. So how do you think we can kind of 
engage designers in applying speculative design, get them to you know try it out and see the value of it? Yeah. Well, I think uh, I think there are a lot of uh, on any sort of beginning or open project brief uh, where you're actually tasked with solving a particular problem. I think you know, we, we always have this sort of divergent moment, right, where we're creating a lot of different prototypes. And I don't think it nece we necessarily need to say, okay, all of our prototypes will be future here. But I think even carving out a small space within that sort of divergent moment to mm -hmm. say, these are, these are sort of further out, uh, you know, uh, uh, possible solutions, yeah. or these, these are solutions taking existing technology that we maybe don't have capability in-house, but will absolutely impact our industry. Mm -hmm. So I think just framed within those, those existing moments of the design process, I think that could be a, a, starting, a starting point. No, yeah. Thank you. Great. Cheers. Okay, great. Well, thank you very much. Thanks very much, Paul. That was really great.